Hello everyone. Uh, happy Sunday, I guess. Um, I'm Carla Kopp. I am a game designer, developer, and publisher, and I am here today with the amazing Fertessa Elise. Um, she has designed uh, Book of Villainy, Wicked and Wise, Mansplaining, um, and she also works for Funko Games, um, which is, was formerly known as uh, Prospero Hall. Um, so, Fertessa, can you tell us a little bit more about yourself? Yes. So I started out in Atlanta, uh, started designing about three years ago. Uh, Book of Villainy was my very first game. Um, I also, for a time, wor wor wrote with Girls Game Shelf, um, which is headed with Anna Maria um, and, and um, a really awesome team there. And um, I've also been, she's saying, working on Wicked and Wise as well as Mansplaining. Um, and right now I'm a game producer at Funko Hall, which was Funko Games, which is formerly Prospero Hall. Um, and I'm in Seattle. Yeah, so Fertessa's like living the dream because she gets paid full time to do games all the time. So. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, the best. So uh, today we're going to be talking about getting past design blocks. Um, so first off, like Fertessa, how do you even... Um, like define a design block? So for me, I designed it, I, I designated two different types of blocks. Um, there's kind of the lack of inspiration and um, a lack from demotivation, um, excuse me, a block from lack of inspiration and a block from um, demotivation. And so, the the lack of inspiration is either whenever you just can't find any sort of um, content, think of any content um, for your designs, and you're just kind of, the well is empty. Um, the other one is whenever you are, uh, your mind is occupied with too many other things, because um, a lot of us are juggling full-time jobs or or, you know, families, things like that. And um, especially with the pandemic, your brain can be full with a lot of things and it's just hard to focus on design even though you may want to. So that's also another type of creative block. And the last one with the demotivation, that one is more whenever you've had a really rough play test or you know, you've know you been trying to tackle a problem and you've you've tackled it 10 different times, but you're just not getting anywhere. Um, I found that I've gotten into this place where I get demotivated to work on it. And it may be that I know what to do and I have steps on what to do next, but I just kind of set it to the side and can't get over that hump to make myself do those things and you know go to the next step. So those are the types of blocks that I'm talking about. Okay, I really like how you break it up into the two different ones, because like, uh, sometimes uh, um, I can hear my, uh, my voice come back. So, Marcus, can you hold on mute? Or I'll mute you. There, I did it. Um, anyway, thank you for being here. Um, <laughs> it's fine. Uh, my brain just sometimes like shuts down if I hear things. Mm -hmm. but, um, Anyway, I really enjoyed uh, that you broke it up into the two different ones because uh, usually when you talk about design blocks, I, I just think about the inspiration one and I didn't even think mm -hmm. about the whole like demotivation one as an option because like I'm actually in like a design block right now and a few of my things just mm -hmm. because I've like I have lists of things to do. I just haven't done it. So yeah. Yeah. I find that those are like the biggest for me, those were the biggest sources of like time. I won't even say time wasted, but kind of time in between any sort of changes on my designs um, and the bigger challenges whenever I was um, working on designs or am working on designs. So uh, which of these two do you think is um, like harder to get out of? I think that's really dependent on the person. Um, personally, I feel like the hardest to tackle is the demotivation one um, because you do already have a direction on where you want to go. 
but it depends on what exactly is kind of sapping away at your your drive to move forward because um, kind of confronting that mentally is going to be the best way to to move forward with it. Um, while with when it comes to inspiration, there are a lot of, to me, quick fixes um, that can quickly get you back in in the mind space within an hour or two of, of doing those things. But when it comes to being demotivated and kind of building up that confidence or just that energy to move forward, um, that takes a little bit more time and coaxing, I think. I would agree on that. Um, you mentioned that um, for the inspiration, there's a bunch of quick fixes. Like, let's start mm -hmm. with those. <laughs> so um, I broke it down again between the fixes for having kind of an occupied mind uh, where you're blocked by everything else going on in your life um, and the dry well sort of a inspiration fix. And the one where your mind is too occupied, for example, with myself, when the pandemic, when the pandemic initially started and you know, everyone really started to lock down and I, I didn't know what to do with myself. And I'd gone from being able to play board games every weekend with my meetup group to just sitting in my house and playing Animal Crossing. And, um, you know, for the life of me, I could not for about three to four weeks it just motivate myself to, to, uh, get started on a design or even want to get in a design space um, because my mind was so full of all of the things on social media telling me how much worse the, the pandemic was getting and, you know, all the, the things that were just scaring me. And um, I, I, I struggled to even want to pick up a board game that even like just separately from, from designing, I didn't even want to play board games. Um, and it wasn't until I put my mind in a creative space that I was able to return to that. And by putting it in creative space, um, some of the quick fixes can be reading a book, listening to audiobooks, even watching a movie, but things that force your mind to engage with fiction is best. And I, I personally, I feel that books and audiobooks do that because they force you to create um, create what the character looks like based off a description and create the world, you know, based off the descriptions. So they kind of engage your, your mind in these um, creative exercises naturally. And I found that after listening to an audiobook, book, um, all of a sudden my thoughts started leading back to game design. And I just felt so much less pressure uh, and, and relief from what was preoccupying my mind uh, previously. So really, if you trick your mind into going into that creative space, that's how um, I successfully got around that creative block. So audiobooks um, and fiction. <laughs> no, I really like that because like uh, you can also get like tons of ideas and stuff or like just do research into mm -hmm. like different areas like like if you want to make, I don't know, a fantasy game, just read some fantasy books and you might get some ideas. Or like if it's magic, read mm -hmm. things about magic and like it just instantly does it. Um, and if you mm -hmm. have a library card, it can be free. Yep. I don't know if you've taken advantage of that, but I've definitely gone out and uh, oh, like, yeah. uh, there's a the Libby app and I've just been like collecting uh, different <laughs> library subscriptions because like I know librarians mm -hmm. and it's like, yep, just please hook me up. Um, I'll just, I'll just <laughs> the audio books and stuff and it'll be great. Um, yes. There's such a joy to rediscovering the library as just being like, this is all free. I don't even know what this is. I'm just pick it up, see what it is. Exactly. Like, <laughs> if you don't like it, put it back. It's fine. All right. That's um, fine. <laughs> so yeah, that's super fun. And, and just, you know, it's really about getting your your brain to to step away from like the reality that is overwhelming it and and however you do that what what works for you because 
I chose audiobooks because at the time I wasn't working at Funko and I had a nine to five job. So audiobooks worked because I could have that playing while I was working. And, um, you know, it, for people that find themselves more limited in time and they can't sit down and, you know, read a book, but a book is also ideal. Um, and then the other thing that I mentioned before with like having the dry well of, of kind of content to draw from, um, the the way that you fill that one up is um, playing games, <laughs> like playing so many other games um, it was super helpful for that because especially when I started out um, with game design, I was very new to the hobby and I only really knew about roll and move. So like playing other games immediately gave me so many different mechanics to work from and, and uh, kind of let me eat up different elements of games that I just never saw before. And even if I had seen them before, everybody executes things differently. There's like a subtle difference even, you know, from one worker placement to the next. Um, so kind of admiring that, um, the differences between games, kind of analyzing why am I enjoying this game right now or why is this game torture to me right now rather than leaving it as a blanket statement. You know, I I like to think about games in that way while I'm playing through kind of these polished games. And that helps me kind of come back to my own game design um, pretty easily. Um, and then what Carla mentioned uh, earlier is, you know, if you have a game centered around a certain theme, then watching things or, or reading things that are revolved around that theme fictionally, um, that is super helpful just to kind of return to why did I enjoy this theme so much? Like if I made a game about villains, I'm going to watch all my Disney villains, all my Ghibli films and, and, and just be like, why do I love this villain? Oh yeah. So this is what I want to make sure I want to stick to. Um, and then, you know, the other thing is helping other people with their game design. Uh, like if I wanted to take a break from mine, because um, you want to also make sure that you're taking a break guilt-free because guilt is another drain on your energy, your creative energy. Um, and you're not failing yourself or your game by taking a step back. Uh, but what you're doing is, you know, reapplying your energy to someone else because by thinking about other people's problems um, and trying to tackle things in ways that you would have never thought of, it somehow kind of comes back to your own design. Um, so playtesting other people's games was super helpful to me, or even just, you know, being on the BGG forum and, and answering questions that maybe I, I didn't even feel qualified to answer, but I would think about them to see if I could find an answer. And, you know, that helped as well. I really like uh, how you say the answering questions on the BGG forum. Um, because like mm -hmm. I assume like a lot of us like we can't like go to like playtesting events or anything else right now, mm -hmm. um, but we can still definitely go onto the BGG forum and like mm -hmm. that is super easy. Um, you don't need to be like super skilled in TTS or anything like that. You just need to be able to type and read things and like so anyone should be able to do that. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, that is definitely a good yeah. uh, option. Yeah, when I, I started out, I, because I'm introverted, I tried to do a lot
this. So it's easy to find things that relate to what kind of area I want my brain to jump into. Um, but for breaking into board games, I love that because it's more about the designer and they just kind of explore the designer's journey, their mindset, their, um, they're just general thoughts on what's going on in their life now. So it helped me become more familiar with, with other designers and just kind of what, where other people were coming from and, and what inspired other people. And it'd be like, huh, well, that's interesting. I never would have thought of that. So I like that. Yeah, I really liked uh, breaking into board games. Like, well, cause it showed like, there's like so many different ways you could break into board games. Um, so mm -hmm. that is like definitely super helpful. And like uh, mm -hmm. just after like hearing somebody's uh, like story and stuff, it made like going to conventions like a lot easier because like you get to kind of like know people a little by hearing them on a podcast. And then it's like if you're an introvert, um, it mm -hmm. just like you you know something about them. There's something you can talk about. If you like just freeze up, you can be like, hey, I love mm -hmm. that interview. So, um, yep. yeah, I definitely second. Um, uh, both of those podcasts as good ones. Mm -hmm. um, what are your favorite Facebook groups for um, getting your inspiration? Uh, so to tie go into that, I'm on the Board Game Design Lab uh, Facebook group, which is um, pretty cool. There's also some specifically like for women, women in board gaming. And um, there is the, I want to say publishers speed dating uh, one, which I really liked because people post their sell sheets. And um, I found that super helpful because you could post your sell sheet and get really good critical feedback, but you can also um, critique other people's sell sheets and, and help. So in that thing where I mentioned before about kind of helping people with their questions, sell sheets are easy um, to kind of give feedback on and, and give back to the community. So. Um, I liked the group that kind of focused on that. Um, there's also a, there's an art group that I'm a part of, and I can't remember the name, but um, in art in general, I like to answer those questions because they're not as technical. And I went to school for art, so it, it feels like I, I have a little bit more to say for that. So um, I, that's why I gravitate towards that. But um, the other ones I mentioned are also very good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like, uh, I always try to give back, like, in different ways, and um, how I used to do it was, like, just to critiquing rules, but I definitely agree that, like, sell sheets, like, how long does it take to look at a sell sheet? Like, like five yeah. minutes to look at it and give, like, your initial thoughts and stuff, so. Mm -hmm. um, but it's super helpful, because, like, if somebody doesn't look at my sell sheet, I don't know what's wrong with it, so. Yeah. And I, I agree with the critiquing rules also. I did that more on BGG um, and that it's the thing that a lot of people don't want to do, but a lot of people need other people to do. So there's always going to be somebody who needs rules read and, you know, you can access that on your phone and take your time. Um, it was just, it was a bit of a time sink for me because I get very detailed <laughs> about that. that. Um, but that is also an excellent way to contribute and kind of see how people lay out their rules because it helped me see, okay, this is the thing my brain is looking for whenever I first open a rule book. This is, you know, what I need, where I need an image. You know, this doesn't make sense to me when this happens. Um, and you can apply that to your own game design later because whenever you're doing something and you're working on it hour after hour, you know, it's very hard to see outside of your own mind because it makes sense to you because you created it but um that's why you want to kind of put in the practice working on other people's things that you didn't create because it makes it a lot easier to retain um what the other person will have to deal with whenever they are interfacing with your game yeah i like uh, getting the different perspectives and everything um and like just seeing like rules done well and not well and I think like over the years of doing that like I've created like my own template based on like mm -hmm. all the different things that I just really liked and everyone else's um yeah one thing um or one uh reason I used to do rules all the time is um I used to travel and do like I was like on work like I'd, I'd travel for work and things and uh 
I just mm-hmm. print out like a bunch of rules documents. So like when I was just yeah. sitting, sitting around, like uh, I'd sometimes be like in military uh, locations where it's like, you can't have your phone. And I'd be like, mm. well, I got these documents and I'm just going to like yep. critique them. And then um, I even would just like uh, scan them in and like have the other person deal with like my terrible writing. Yeah. But they loved it. They they were so happy mm-hmm. that somebody actually like printed out their thing and cared and sent yep. it back. Like even if it wasn't like, the most ideal thing like uh mm-hmm. helping is helping yeah exactly because there's just there's a lot of us you know it's a small community but there's a lot of us and you know any any person that can help that sincerity is is really appreciated um as i found um so um can you describe like any of your specific design blocks that you've had and uh how you got over them sure and before I do that, uh, is it okay to go over the kind of inspiration for instances where you get demotivated? demotivated? Oh, yeah, we should definitely do that. We cannot miss the demotivation. <laughs> so before when I mentioned um, having creative blocks, there's one from your mind being too occupied with something else. There's whenever your brain is kind of a dry well for uh, creativity or content. And then the last thing was whenever you are demotivated, um, either because, you know, you had just the worst kind of play test session, session or you've been working on a particular thing and what, whatever you've been trying hasn't been working. You get to this point where you start dragging your feet and you just stop walking at all. Um, and I've had this happen several times, but whenever you get demotivated, um, the thing that I found Um, that helps me move forward is to set a date and it has to be a date that you don't really have control over Um, so joining a contest or um, you know having a convention though now an online convention that you're going to bring your game to you or like arranging a play test um, a digital play test uh, that that date is set in stone you need a date and for me, that just lights a fire under my feet because otherwise I'm just going to sit there and say, oh, I'm going to do it when I'm in the mood, when the creativity strikes me.
feel like your imposter syndrome um, that's easy to have. And um, that's something that I continue to try and, and, and push against. And I find that by just embracing game design and um, talking with people and, you know, accepting them as they accept me, um, that, that really helps with that and, and with kind of pushing back on that demotivation because I feel like, oh man, who did I think I could be a designer, you know, or, you know, they think I'm a good designer, but they don't know, they don't know my creative block woes, you know, <laughs> so um, that it just, that's just getting in your head and, and setting that deadline and enjoying these random things are ways to kind of make you step outside of your head before you go in too deep. Yeah. Yeah, I definitely agree with with all that. Like it's it's so easy to have imposter syndrome and just like not know how to deal with it, but like just like forcing yourself to do it. Like uh, at one point in time, like I like uh so I'm like a super introvert and I just did not want to like go and do these things. Like like I'd be like, "Oh yeah, everyone's going to hate me and they're going to hate my game and it's going to be terrible." And like it was like uh, my anxiety was so bad, like I would actually like throw up every time like before going to a convention but eventually it stopped like I don't do that anymore because I just I kept forcing myself I was like like even with all this anxiety like this is how I become a better designer this is how I meet friends like maybe nobody at this convention will like me but I don't know that until I actually try so yeah and now it's like yeah. uh, the community is like a, just a bunch of friends and like I love it like I love interacting with all these people that I really enjoy and they're so different and unique and helpful too. Um, mm -hmm. Estefania had a question. Um, how many games um, do you balance uh, at once in your head and um, how many of those in your head do you physically like work on at a time? So I I'm I really prefer kind of a tunnel vision style, um, at least. So this is an asterisk. Previously, I would always do kind of tunnel vision where I would work on one game at a time. And um, I any other games or inspiration I would have, I would write it down. I have notebooks full of ideas. And it'd just be like, OK, stop here. We will come back to you later. Um, so whenever I got a point where I was I had a more polished version of a game that's whenever I would allow myself to work on a, a new game um, just because I kind of go all in on that one game um, and I feel like I have limited memory so I didn't want to juggle the rules for two different games um, but the thing about that changed uh, whenever I started working at Funko and I started working at like four games at once and it actually was not as stressful as I thought. Um, but here's the asterisk. In my previous um, kind of tunnel vision mindset, I was also working a nine to five job that had nothing to do with board games versus now I work and it is my job to do board games. So I had the bandwidth to do that. Um, so with very little bandwidth, one game at a time, but with all the bandwidth, I can do multiple. I can be superwoman. <laughs> so, um, yes. And oh, Carla, I was also going to say earlier, uh, you didn't know this, but the first time that we actually sat down for a game at Proto ATL, it was you were actually the very first publisher I ever had a game with. And I was so nervous. Like, I can't remember the guy that was at the table before, but he was like, it's okay, Carla's really nice. And we had a good game because you, you played Book of Villainy with me. And I was just like, oh, my God, she's going to hate me. She is going to hate this. <laughs> and it went just fine. It was like, it was a great game. Carla was excellent. And then after the game, I went to another room. I was like, I need to find a quiet room. And then I cried because I was so anxious. It's just from building up, like, just playing with a publisher. And it's just like, you... It is so important to get to know people in the community and to get comfortable in that imposter syndrome. It's real. Um, and, you know, after that, you know, we would run into each other at different conventions and Carla was just like, oh, 
oh, there's a person I know. Yes, let's play games together. You know, so it's it's really putting yourself out there because I I'd actually been avoiding having games with publishers because I was so scared of like just getting my head bitten off and or pissing them off or wasting their time. And I just built them up to this this thing. And and that's why it's really important to go outside of your comfort zone and and, you know, aren't necessarily how you built them up. And, you know, just don't don't sit in your head because it it can lead to a really, really happy you. Yeah, I did not know that I was like the first publisher you'd ever sat with. Like, uh, you didn't seem like yeah. that. Like, you seem like uh, you're perfectly normal <laughs> just teaching your game. Like, you'd done like, uh, all yes. the convention or whatever. So, like, yeah, you did definitely didn't seem that way. Um, but I think like <laughs> that's an important point because like uh, like me going to conventions and like actually getting like sick before them like. I was like, at, when I'm actually there, like, I, I think I come off as like a completely normal person, but like, we all have like these things going on in our head and nobody knows. Like, like we have all this imposter syndrome in our own brains, like sabotaging ourselves. But like, unless you're inside your head, like you don't know. And this could be happening with everyone. Like you're not alone in feeling like uh, so much anxiety and being so nervous to do all these things. Um, mm -hmm. I think just like acknowledging that, like acknowledging, like, oh yeah, everyone else was nervous when they started. You know, you you're not different or I don't know, weird, dumb, whatever. You're just like everyone else, and you can go as far as everyone else too. Mm -hmm. Agreed. So, um, are there any questions? Yeah, any other questions? Because we're getting down to uh, the last nine minutes. Um, and you can put them in the, the chat or whatever. Uh, but uh, while we're waiting for the more questions, um, is there anything else in game design that you're really passionate about? Oh, let's see. Anything else in game design? I mean, I really like talking about the social interaction of games. Um, I usually... Uh, like the the thing I'll stand on the hill for is Monopoly <laughs> because people that was like the biggest kind of culture shock almost for me coming into the hobby gaming was how much people hated Monopoly. And, and you know, I realized that the reason I felt so strongly about it was because it had such social implications for me. And I think that whenever you people enjoy games in different ways, um, and just knowing that it can be about the social aspect versus the skill aspect and, you know, why some people are comfortable with luck while other people are more com comfortable with games where they can math out all the, uh, the possibilities before they make a move, you know, and it, it honestly is a study of human nature for me because, you know, there can be the person who has AP uh, analysis paralysis where they have options and they have to sit there for five minutes to think about their turn and, you know, what they're about to do and, and you know, what's going to be advantageous. And then, you know, they do the thing that's most likely going to make them win because if it's against me, I'm like a tank on World of Warcraft. I'm just going to come swinging. I'm just going to do the thing that's most obvious. It's like, does this get me the points? I'm doing it. I'm doing it. I know I'm going to lose, but I'm going to do it. It feels great. We're going to do that. So, like, just having the different people, um, you know, how they enjoy games and, and what they get out of them and, you know, why, why game design is important to one person while, you know, why a, a, a person doesn't play games at all. And, but they have this one board game or this one card game that their family knows how to play is so interesting to me. So, um that's what I enjoy about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and there's like so many different ways that people can enjoy. Like there's all the different player um, styles, but also like it can depend on who you're playing with and when you're playing. And like you could enjoy things for different reasons depending on the day or um, like who's around. So yeah, it's it's really a, a social experiment, especially with play testing. Um, like mm -hmm. I've become like so much better at like, people watching um mm -hmm. since play testing so much because like 
Um, you kind of just have to like stare at people to like try to figure out what they're thinking. Um, well, because like mm-hmm. uh, you might ask somebody what they're thinking and like they will give you an answer, but is that like all the story? Like we don't know mm-hmm. our own brains, which is like such a the fascinating part of it. Like, uh, yeah, because you have to like know like one you have to care about what that person thinks that they're thinking and then you also have to care about what Mm -hmm. they're actually thinking and those can be Mm -hmm. so different depending on the person yeah i've had many a play test where it was kind of a mediocre play and the people at the end would just be like oh but it was fun i would do it you know yeah yeah it was cool and everyone kind of politely finishes off with it was fun and it's just like "Mm -mm, i was watching you this whole game (laughs) <laughs> and it, it, even if you didn't say anything, but hmm, that's interesting. It's like, oh, let me write down the mechanic was interesting because that you know people might not elaborate, they might not know how, or they might not feel comfortable. So you know, it's it. I also think that it's fun to kind of read the body language or the the verbal or um, not verbal, but the non audible language um, of people whenever they are playing a game that. They don't even realize that they're giving off um, because, you know, politeness can can be a barrier sometimes whenever you are the game designer and they they like you and they don't want to hurt your feelings. And, uh, you know, I think that's an important skill to be able to have. But um, it's also fun because you're people watching and, and ultimately that's that's what you're building your game for is to interact with people and to get them to you know feel that elation and joy when they're playing when you're not around watching so um that that is a fun puzzle in itself Mm -hmm. um so where can people find you after this uh so i will be around on twitter at fortessa uh pretty simple (laughs) and uh that's pretty much i'll keep all my updates there um you can also find me on Facebook, but if you friend me, just like shoot me a message because I get a lot of randoms now with no messages. Um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, I, I keep it I keep it pretty simple, but I do update those. I am on BGG, but posting less now with the job. Um, so, but if you ever have any questions or or anything like that, then yeah, just hit me up on either Facebook or uh, Twitter, and I will get back to you. Um, so Estefania had one last question. Um, what is something mm-hmm. that is most important to you when you design a game? Is playtesting the most important part or is it is the design process or something else? I think the most important part is keeping the identity of my game. Um, and I spoke with Carla on this uh, way earlier about the core of your game. Um, But whenever I start out, I like to create a core and it's not a mechanic, but it's just something that shouldn't change that forms the identity of my game and why I'm inspired to work on it and and even put it to create it. Um, And so protecting that while, you know, letting it change and and, and morph and evolve, um, that's what's super important is like, if I was motivated to create a game off of it, that's that's going to be my driving force. And that's why that's the most important thing. Well, thank you so much, for Tessa, for being here. Um, you're wonderful and you have all the knowledge on things. And thank uh, everyone else um, for listening and participating. Um, I hope you all have a great uh, rest of your weekend. Thank you all for coming. Yay.